California school replaces third grade math classes with anti-racist social justice curriculum. Yep, third grade math can go. Gotta make way for lots and lots of racial gerrymandering. After all, you don't need math to learn how to burn, loot, and pillage, I suppose. I'm Dr. Duke, she's Katie, and this is The Dr. Duke Show. Hello everyone and welcome to the Dr. Duke Show, the only program that keeps you educated on the craziness of back to K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. Today, we start in San Jose, California, where unbelievably third grade math class has been canceled and replaced with woke, anti-racist indoctrination. We need to teach kids, third graders, about racial white supremacy, not so much about math. So here's what happened. As you said, third grade math, <laughs> Who needs it? Because third grade math, I remember, that's when you did the times table and it was like for speed. And yes, I was the best kid in my class in third grade. It didn't get too much better after that, but that was my highlight. So third grade math, I loved it. But sadly, these eight-year-olds, they don't, they don't get it. They're not allowed to get it because they have to do all these other things about, you know, power and privilege. And so we get a tweet that uh, was sent in by a parent. Um, whose kid is attending the third grade in Meyer Holes Elementary School. And of course, that's in San Jose, California. And just take a look at what the actual curriculum is. So it starts with dominant culture. Katie, what is the dominant culture? Well, the dominant culture, you know, it's just what's normal, mm. in quotation marks. What, what's normal? And of course, in America, what's normal is white middle class, cisgender, your gender identity matches with the sex you were assigned at birth. Educated, able-bodied, Christian, English speaker. And of course, these are bad things in their mind. Things. Well, I love the fact that the idea that your gender identity matches with the body parts you have, that that's controversial now. It's not, con it's, it's to the public school system, it's controversial to believe that not to believe that you can imagine 170 different genders up. That's what gets them as, as odd, right? All right. And, and, wait, how old are third graders? Five, eight-year-olds, eight, right? Eight-year-olds yeah. eight we're doing this too, okay? Just so everyone's aware, eight. eight-year-olds. Um, so then not only do they need to know what the dominant culture is, we need to talk about you know your identity mm -hmm. and this power and this privilege that you have because if you are any of those things on that list, then obviously you have power and privilege. So shame on you. So power and privilege, when you fit in the dominant culture and can make changes, choices, and decisions easily. That's what they're, they're talking about. And so they're going to, of course, we're going to use our books because we read aloud here uh, in, in San Jose class. in math class. And we're going to read from this book is anti-racist. This book is a number one New York Times bestseller recommended by Oprah's book club. Who decided number one was better than one, one million? Who decided that? I want to know. I want names. Yeah, he'll be here all day, folks. Just be I'd happy like to you think don't it have was to a, deal I'd with it I'd like to think it was a day. comedy routine. <laughs> But, it's but I can't even muster up laughter for it anymore. Yeah, I, it's just so pathetic. This is the truth. And go back to the picture again one more time. So this is the argument. And a dominant culture. Is it fair to say, Katie, mm -hmm. that the dominant culture in public schools is one of radical progressivism? Well, I would say yes, yep. but I'm, I'm of the okay. dominant culture, but I'm not would allowed you to say, say these the, things. Would you say the <laughs> dominant culture of, universe, of public schools is multicultural? Mm -hmm. yep. Would you say the dominant culture of, of American public schools is left-wing? Yep. Yep. So yep. if it's the dominant yep. culture there, shouldn't we be undoing the dominant culture? You would think. And so what if we actually rebelled against the dominant political sociological culture of the, universe, of the public schools and went back, and how do you protest? How about with math class or math? How about math in math class for third graders? Wouldn't that be... The kids holding the picket sign, Wouldn't teach me math. Right. Teach me math. I mean, math. seriously, we've reached the point yeah. now where they are the dominant culture lecturing you because, <laughs> you know, the, your world has to become their world. Yep. They're the ones that have taken third grade math and appropriated it for their own wicked purposes. It's an insane world we live in, isn't See, it? I can't, even, I, I can't even muster the energy anymore. It's just... <sighs> You know, we talk about mind control a lot on this show with the children's and the public schools, and you know, it's with good reason. Let's insert example A, where we have La Jolla Country Day's head of school in San Diego, California, Gary Crane. He decided, you know, I'm going to make a video, even though I'm in a room all by myself, I'm going to wear my mask as well, and I'm going to talk about my decision to tell a poor little high school student that he had to remove 
his Make America Great Again hat, and how, you know, removing it was actually all about dignity. A student came onto campus with a Make America Great Again hat. He has every right to wear that hat. I had friends give their life for that right. It was not a political decision to reach out to him and talk about that hat. It was a decision about dignity, the inherent value that all humans have. When I approached the student, I shared with him that he had that right to wear the hat. I also shared with him the impact it has on our community. That hat has a symbol of racism and hatred. We could argue about whether that's true or not, but it's a fact that in our community, there's a belief that that's what that hat represents. And because we're a community of dignity, that all people have value and that all people are vulnerable, I wanted the student to know that his decision was going to have an impact on people. He graciously took off his hat. So on the one hand, politically, he has the right to wear this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crane, for reasserting, because it's only true when you say it. You pulled this kid out of class to have a conversation with him about his hat. And I just want to thank you so much because without your validation, that wouldn't be true. So you give, you've told him that he has the right to wear that hat. And you had friends who fought and died for that right. Isn't that wonderful? I wonder how those friends who fought and, di and died for that right would think about your dignity argument. Your argument that something higher than free speech, something higher than liberty is dignity. And isn't that interesting? Because it's never once defined in the Constitution. But you, Mr. Crane, Bob Crane, as far as I'm concerned, you, sir, you decided to find it your way. You decided that your dig you get to decide dignity. The Founding Fathers had no say in it because you decide dignity means something that you oppose politically, that you've elevated that above all those other rights. And you said to the young man, right? That in our, we could debate all we want about whether this, a hat, a stupid hat with Make America Great on it, we can debate all day long whether or not it's true. But what is true, people in my community believe it's true. As an educator, don't you have a moral obligation to unteach that? If people in your community don't believe the Holocaust ever happened, would you be okay with that? Would you be okay with getting rid of Holocaust museums like this Guy we looked at last week, the superintendent who was fired from his job for not committing to the idea that the Holocaust was real, all he did is refuse to assert it was true. He didn't deny it. You, on the other hand, are basically telling this kid dignity as you define it. Some people in my community believe what happens to align with my political worldview. And so therefore, I'm going to use dignity to bully you, yes, bully you, into taking the hat off. And the fact that the kid took it off graciously, right? In no way, shape, or form changed the fact that you as an administrator at that school bullied him into doing it. Well, according to Crane, he wrote an email and he sent it out to all um, of the staff before he actually filmed the hostage video. And he said, we also had a student wear a Make America Great Again hat today. I have talked with that student who now understands why that hat is offensive to our community. He will not wear it again. In addition, his mom said that she is embarrassed by his actions. She will fulfill her role as a parent. We will continue to grow as a community that sees and values the dignity of all people. No, you don't. You see, value the dignity of people who agree with your politics. That's what you're doing. And this smug, condescending, arrogant video you made. It doesn't make you look measured and calm and intelligent. It just reveals to be the worst kind of a bully. You know what the worst kind of bully is, sir? It's the bully who doesn't realize he's a bully or pretends he's not. I would rather have my kid's lunch, kid, my, my kid's lunch money stolen every single day by thugs who grab him by the ankles, shake the money out of his pocket, then, give, then dunk his head in a toilet, than have this kind of bullying. This bullying that masquerades as enlightened thinking. Because you're, how many kids, including the mother of that child, have you convinced that your bullying equals somehow legitimate academic discourse and argumentation? It does not. You can hide behind that mask, sir, and you can hide behind all your carefully measured words, a la Bob Ross, all you want. You can do what you got to do, but in the, at the end of the day, what you did is inhumane. It is anti-education. It is anti-liberty. It's not about free speech. It's not about freedom and dignity. You've created a word here that you have endowed, endowed with power that allows only people who see your definition of that word to have a say in things. Congratulations. You are a bigot of the highest magnitude.
Did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear? Christmas came early for the teachers unions, even though we know apparently Christmas is canceled, according to everyone on the left. But uh, they're still going to get their goods in the teachers union because they simply are gleeful, gleeful of all things, because now Betsy DeVos, secretary of education, will not be secretary of education if Joe Biden is indeed president. So the teachers unions, they're just (laughs) this is the best day of the year. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will stand with us as we work to reclaim public education as a common good, as the foundation of this democracy. Yeah, so that was Becky Pringle, and she is the president of the National Education Association. And she, uh, I took a look at the video and it had a whole 200 or so views on it. So she's, she's reaching her people. But we know behind the scenes that they really are reaching the people and by reaching them it means like grabbing them by the throat and forcing them to do whatever they want because that's what the teachers unions do did you notice that she says nothing about actual education why would she reclaim education as a common good for the democracy what she's not taught how are you going to do that uh uh miss pringle how are you going to do that when you're not teaching kids reading writing math well we have another quote from her oh yeah absolutely where and listen to this quote now here's see if you can figure out what the public schools are about because again hint there will be no mention what Whatsoever of any kind of academic achievement or behavior. Listen again. Step one will be to replace Betsy DeVos with an education secretary who will understand and value and protect public education and respect the voices and professional expertise of educators. NEA's vision for public education is to transform it into a racially and socially just and equitable system that's actually designed to prepare every student, everyone, to succeed in a diverse and interdependent world. The purpose of public school is to racially transform in the name of social justice public schools away from anything that is remotely like a school. It is to bully, hector, and lecture kids until white kids have the same kind of guilt complexes you claim black people have lived under for hundreds of years. Fair enough, but call it what it is. No, now go back to the first story of today. No math, instead of math we have social justice posturing, right? This is the future of your schools. They just told you this. Oh, and by the way, as far as we know, the only two names that the Biden administration has floated for possible successors to Betsy DeVos are the leading heads of two teachers unions. Do you really believe that a teacher union boss like this clown, Pringle, are the people that are gonna make your schools democratic again, to, to bring your, to reclaim your schools in anything like what a school ought to be doing? Maybe we stop calling them schools because they're not schools. The word school going way back to the ancient Greeks has to do with knowledge, scholastia, right? Maybe we should stop calling them schools and start calling them camps. How about that, like re-education camps, right? Let's call them public school, public, uh, I did it Mm -hmm. again. How about we call them the public camp system? Public camps, is that enough? Will it be PC, public camps? Yeah, we need need another adjective, public something camps. Hmm. Um, Public. We'll have to think on that. Yeah, we'll have to. There's a lot of good Soviet but ones we can But use. I did just come up while she was speaking of, you know, she's so happy about Christmas. I just came up with a good Christmas gift, the Mad Libs version of education, because every other word is like a Mad Lib. She talks about how understanding and protecting and reclaiming equitable racially socially just mm-hmm. everything is the word soup so we could just make a mad lib version of this and hand it out to your kids at christmas but it's not oh. a, but it's not a school there you go I like our it. friend becky also took to the twitter and she said i'm relieved and overjoyed i'm also feeling overwhelmingly gratitude over i'm also feeling overwhelming gratitude because of you all we'll soon have a president committed to protecting and uplifting our communities for the first time the vice president will be a black woman and a daughter of immigrants because that is the number one that says it all to me yep for what you know you have to have that that's kids gonna make your kids that's gonna make your kids smarter having kamala harris as a daughter of immigrants right that's going to make your kids just so much better in the public school. That alone, right? That's all you really need. But everyone at some time was in 
daughter, brother, sister, uncle, cousin of an immigrant, but they, we only That's we not, only value certain no, ones. But no, the, Ameri- the Europeans who came here weren't immigrants; they were conquerors. <laughs> you know? That's a good point. You know how that works? Well, Becky also had a follow-up tweet saying, "You, an educator, an at the NEA Today member, an activist, made this happen. You." Uh, Never forget how powerful we are as a profession and as a union. I look forward to winning our next righteous fight alongside you. But for today, let's celebrate. Mm. Hashtag NEA votes. And the moral of the story for Betsy DeVos is don't wait until you're two and a half years of your four (laughs) years before you start doing anything. And Republicans, the party is stupid. Again, this is pointless. This is the horses out of the barn and drowned in the local pool advice. So it doesn't matter because we're not going to be having a Republican president anytime soon. And we're certainly not going to have a Republican, a conservative running the Department of Education anytime again. So this is kind of moot advice. But the moot advice is notice how they get started from day one. They will walk into office mid-January and change everything you did in three weeks. It took you three years to do the little that you did do, Betsy DeVos, and it's gone now. Way to be exactly what they want in a, in a public school uh, administrator. Somebody who's going to change it, but only very slowly. And this is the meat and potatoes part of it. They actually gave credit to all of the heroic actions that all these NEA members did. And they talked about the Red for Ed, yep. hashtag protest Red for Ed, which, if you didn't know, is when all the teachers left the school building, yep. left those kids there to cry so that they could protest to get more money. Not and to teach but to go protest. And that's what they're claiming is why it's because you did that, And again, teachers. this is about the union. Did you hear the public school kids mentioned once? No. In her, all that talk from her, did you once hear the, st- the st- kids mentioned? No. And as Arne Duncan, Barack Obama's secretary said, America just won. Oh yeah, okay. And the Chicago Teachers Union, bye Betsy, congratulations. Because now American left, you own education even more than you ever did before. And that little progress that was made in the last four years will be eradicated by the time uh, February 1st rolls around. And I just remind your mom and dad, they're telling you to your face, to your face, that your public schools are not about your kids' ed- education. It's not about your kids as human beings. They don't even mention your kids. It is a sop for all of their special interest groups, none more special than the union itself. It's time for some real education. James Abbott McNeil Whistler was born in 1834 and died in 1903. He was an American artist, but he was primarily based in the United Kingdom, and he was active during the American Gilded Age. In his painting, he disliked sentimentality and moral illusion and stuck by his credo, art for art's sake. Best known of his work is Arrangement in Gray and Black No. 1 of 1871. It's commonly known as Whistler's Mother and is a revered and often parodied portrait of motherhood. Yeah, take a look at the picture. This is, this is one of the great classics. You could make an argument that this is the most recognizable p- piece of American painting in the history of America, which is ironic because Whistler, while a, an American, did most of his work in Europe. And actually, the painting doesn't, I don't think it's ever actually hung in an American gallery. It was bought early on by the French. You, you can't even really see it. in Amer- You've never been able to see it in America. And yet it is this icon of Americanness, which is very bizarre. But as you take a look at the picture, it's very stark, right? You see why now, looking at the picture, uh, its actual name is Arrangement and gray in, in Gray and Black. It's a painting in oil on canvas, as, as Katie said, 1871. The subject of the painting is Whistler's mother, Anna McNeil Whistler. The painting is 57 inches by 64 inches and is displayed in a, pra- a frame that, desi- that was designed by Wh- uh, Whistler himself. It is held by the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, having been bought by the French state in 1891. So within 20 years of its creation, this great American masterpiece was bought by the French. And actually, Whistler pawned it because he couldn't find a use for it. It's one of the most famous works by an American artist outside of the United States. It has been variously described as an American icon and a Victorian Mona Lisa. That's pushing things, right? Uh, What do we get from the... Go back to her. Look at that face. Go to the next image, Mike. 
There's the model for this, Whistler's Mother, and go to the next one to see how it's been parodied. This is a, 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 a monument to motherhood in Canada so that, that, that borrows that same image, the image of Whistler's Mother in that particular pose. And you can sort of see it there, right? I mean, look at that grim face. You can see why it's called a Victorian Mona Lisa. You don't even get a little bit of ankle in that one. You, 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 chin and black shoes are all you get there. Uh, the gray and black are uh, a, a, a sort of social parody of the blandness of Victorian culture, which under the surface had smoldering all those monsters, right? All Jekyll and Hyde and Dracula and all the, all the monstrous things that lurk just below the surface, but very, very prosaic and very, very literal. Art for art's sake, Whistler said. And so make of, you, make of it what you will, but it's the strangest American piece of iconic art that really isn't very American when it's all boiled down. All right. Before we go, just a reminder that the best way to keep up with our various shows at Freedom Project is to follow us on Parlor. Take 10 whole seconds. Follow us today at Dupesta, at Katie, and at Freedom Project. Thank you ever so kindly. Now, we want to take a moment to show some love, as we do from time to time here, for our Patriot Club members. Because you know what? They keep this show going. So today, we're going to give a shout out to Mike from Ipsanti, Michigan. Good old Michigan. Thank you for supporting all of us here at the Dr. Duke Show and beyond. Thank you, Michael. And if you're a fan of the show, please consider a one-time tax-deductible donation to support the Patriot Club, and we're going to send you an awesome Tumblr as a thank you. All you have to do to sign up is visit patriotclub.us. That's patriotclub.us. Now we're going to wrap things up with the fun fact of the day. Though disputed, chimichangas actually came from Tucson, Arizona, potentially as early as 1922, and the name actually means thingamajig. Now, one source says a female cook coined the term after trying not to curse in front of some children. So C-H-I actually begins a Spanish profanity. That's the rumor has it. Chimichanga. I actually remember the candy bar thingamajig. Oh, too, no, you're too, nice. too young for that? I don't think she'll make And that's our show. For Freedom Project, I'm Dr. Duke. She's Katie. Until next time, stay educated, my friends.